Okay, so FOLTA is Feha Gokdina. We have our webinar a cross union grassroots network of three teacher unions, GLOR, Voice for Teachers, TY Grassroots, and ASTI Fightback. My name is Kate Relihan. I'm an INTO member, GLOR activist, and chair of Blanchetown Branch here in Dublin. Today, we have three rank and file union groups that have been instrumental over the past decade in fighting our corner and representing our voices. From pay equality to job bridge to ensuring our health and safety during the pandemic was front and center. This webinar seeks to inform you with honest facts and figures on the proposed pay deal. We hope to counter the many, many false narratives peddled by union leaders, government and backed up by media as we urge you to vote no to this proposed pay cut deal and thereby bring a strong mandate to government that teachers will no longer be walked on or duped. There has been serious conditioning and mistruths by union executives, especially at INTO, who have, as expected, recommended a yes vote. Spinning the best worst deal, the now well-known social partnership line. This is an incredibly demoralizing tactic for all members, especially our lower paid teachers, and only serves to deflate and undermine union power and divide us workers. So we have the situation now where we have teachers up north balloting for industrial action over pay erosion and workload, and down south, we have INTO leaders recommending yes and painting a 3% increase this year as a pay rise when inflation currently hovers at 9%, this is a de facto 6% pay cut. And even the more historically militant unions, ASTI and TUI, have not voted to reject or come out in rejection of this pay deal, but leaves the ballot open without a recommendation. And what's more, this ballot has been railroaded in before the budget, before the massively hiked energy bills, not to mention what's in store for us next year. No way should union leaders be forcing us to lock ourselves to these unacceptable meager sums as the cost of living prices is only beginning. And following the sacrifices of teachers from the brutal austerity measures of a decade ago, hitting our newly qualified teachers so severely, USC, pension levy, two-tier pay, and then risking our lives at the pandemic, female teachers especially grappling with childcare, and teaching online. No way should us members set a precedent that we'll accept any pay deal. To accept a 6% pay cut this year with a surplus by government of 6.3 billion is ludicrous. We have, on the other hand then, ESB company can flout profits of 360 million for the first six months of the year, not to mention the nine Irish billionaires who increased their wealth by a whopping 50 billion during this pandemic. There is plenty money there for inflation busting or double digit pay rises for public sector workers and teachers. Now I'm going to introduce the three speakers of our three respective unions who will elaborate with specifics. To reduce, we'll have Deirdre, INTO staff rep and a delegate, then Keith is going to come in, ASTI member and member of the Executive Council. And finally, we'll have Katrina, TY member and a member of the Second Level Advisory Council. So um, we'll hit the ground running and I'll bring in Deirdre first to speak on uh, behalf of the issues facing INTO members. Garmila Deirdre. Thanks, Kate. Um, my name is Deirdre O'Toole. I am an INTO member and I never thought I'd see the day where I'd be fighting for a, a pay rise, but really when it comes down to it, this isn't for me. This is for, particularly for young teachers, people paying rent, uh, high rent, especially around Dublin, people trying to save for a house. And then all of us who are facing, you know, these high energy bills and, you know, high uh, petrol bills as well. So um, the INTO have been advertising um, this, pay rise as a six and a half percent pay rise and is very very misleading because it's not six and a half percent this year this is a two year um, pay rise so it's going to be spread out from February of this year to October of next year so it's three percent for this year and three and a half percent for next year 
So it's six and a half percent by October of next year. So it's not quite the six and a half percent that they're putting out there. We are due 1% benchmarking. Now, this is regardless of the outcome of the pay deal. In the OLIS that the INTO sent out, it said that this 1% benchmarking was guaranteed. And then I think it was yesterday or the day before the INTO came out with an FAQ and they have said that this 1% benchmarking is not guaranteed and that if we vote no for this deal, we, we may lose that 1%. So very um, conflicting um, information there from the INTO when really they should be presenting facts and making it clear for members so that they don't have to go into great depth to, to find out what is actually happening. Also, our increments are not affected at all. We get our increments as normal. So if we can go on to the next slide there, please. So, um, sorry, technical issues here. <laughs> no, no, I was trying to get it up on my other screen, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, we have just a very simple graph here to show you the young teachers. So the teacher on point two of the scale, they're looking at a pay raise of about a thousand euro um, for 2022. That's before tax. Um, a principal at the top of the pay scale in a 25 teacher school is looking at an increase of about 2,800 and a TD um, roughly the same. So is this fair? Um, really, these young teachers paying rent are the ones who, who need this increase. Um, and this is your 3%. This is outside of your benchmarking or your increments. This is your, um, this is your deal that the, that the INTO are telling you that you're getting. And if we can go on to the, the next slide there. Um, the INTO have also been um, sharing examples. So um, a teacher on this point of the scale will get a pay rise of this. So one of the examples they shared was a teacher um, from post uh, 2011, uh, who are already quite hard done by, um, on point 11 of the scale. Now, anyone who's on point 11 of the scale um, will skip point 12. Um, so that has not been um, mentioned in their advertisement or their, um, their infographic. Um, their um, example is a teacher on point 11 of the post 2011 scale will receive an increase of 7,795 euro. Now that sounds fantastic, an almost 8,000 euro pay raise, that sounds great, but the reality is quite different. Now they have said, oh, this includes the 1% increase in benchmarking and your relevant incremental progression. What they've done here is they've chosen a teacher who is due to skip a point on the pay scale to show a really inflated figure. So um, if we break down that 7,795 euro, approximately 580 euro of that is due to the benchmarking, which they have said we're getting anyway. Um, 5,200 euro of that is the incremental progression. So that's our increment scale. That is not changing, that is not going to change. So that teacher between February of this year and October of next year will go up two points on the pay scale and a teacher on point 11 will actually go up three points. So that's why there's such a big, um, a large figure there, but that's happening Anyway, the real increase for a teacher on point 11 of the scale is about 2,000 euro. That's your, um, your, 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 your real figure. And that is over 2020, 2022 and 2023. So really it's disappointing that the INTO are trying to mislead members and not give, um, while their figures might be accurate, they're misleading um, and they're not telling the real story. Um, and it's very unfair for particularly, like say our young teachers who are already on a different pay scale and facing high rent and high energy bills. So that's it for me. I'm gonna um, pass you on to Keith now. So thanks, thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Eric. Um, my name's uh, Keith Cassidy and I am an ASDI activist member. 
And I suppose I'm, the reason I'm here today, I'd like to get the full extent around the costs that are really facing members. In particular, I want to look at our costs in relation to, in relation to inflation. So I want to say, like, there's been lots of obfuscation around the extent of inflation, whether, it be, whether we're talking about the pain negotiations or what's been headlined in the media. So the best way for us to look at inflation is to look at, well, how much has it been since building momentum commenced? And since building momentum commenced, so we're going right back, I think it was December uh, 2020, I think we commenced. And from December 20 to today, inflation has run at 12.2%. And you can look this up on the CSO, it's a really robust figure. For the CSO, 12.2%. Um, inflation for 2021 was 5.5%. And this year, so far, it's running at 8.9%. So collect, like if you combine that together, if you assume that inflation is going to, uh, well, I suppose we combine what inflation was from last year and currently what is this year, we get our CSO figure of 12.2%. And that means prices are 12.2% higher on average. What does this mean? It basically means it's equivalent to a 12.2% pay cut. And I went back to some old pay slips. And basically for my pay, it brings me back between where I was in 20. If I knock 12% off my pay, it brings me back between where I was in 2018 and 2019 pay slips. So I'm somewhere in the middle there. So you're rolling back your pay, you know, three to four years here. That's the extent of what's happened, just what's happened already. And we know already the extent of the winter that's ahead of us. Um, the other thing, again, is to, to realize about inflation, and I'll make this point again later on, is inflation is a permanent increase in price levels. So, and just to get that extent, that 12.2% increase in prices that we've seen, if inflation goes to zero next year, that 12.2% is locked in. Zero doesn't mean prices have gone back to where they were. Um, not, not to give an economics lecture here, just to clarify some points for people. Um, how does that compare to the past? And one of the key points I look back to was, I know we're going back a good bit now, but back to, um, sorry, uh, we're going back to the uh, austerity era nearly, um, would be that austerity era under the FEMPI legislation, teachers were asked to take a cut of around 14.5% for those on earning on 65,000. Like 14.5%. Well, if we look at this, we're at 12.2% is the pay cut already. And if we look forward to 2023, we can see the forecast there for the, Euro the European Commission's forecast is 3.3%. And I'll tell you now, that's a very, very conservative uh, forecast. Uh, if you look at uh, Citibank, did a forecast for the British economy for next year, and they have it up at 18%. Um, you wanna, so if we combine what the inflation we've had for, to date, what it's likely to be for 2022 plus our 2023, we're talking conservative figure of 17.7% overall price inflation. And that's taking account if we accept the building method proposal for next year. That's more than what we've taken from us during the inflation, during the austerity era and the, the FEMPI cuts that were brought in back in 2009. And that's huge. And I just want to re-emphasize that that inflation, again, it's a permanent, permanent uh, cut from our wages. Uh, just to give you some figures around inflation as well, like where is it going to go in the winter? Like an annual bill for home heating is looking, according to the Green Party, is going to be in around six thousand euros a year, or twelve twelve hundred for a uh, for two months over winter, and that's colossal when you think about it. Food prices, you know, they're they're set to rocket this winter as well. And one of the ones I was interested in was mortgage interest rates. Like they're going, the central bank is pushing up interest rates. The average home is around 300 grand. If you have a mortgage is 300 grand, a 1% increase will work, roughly work out at about an extra 150 a month. If it's a 3% increase, it's on an extra 450 a month on top of your heating uh, rises and all the rest. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, so the WRC uh, negotiates. So we know then that you know, the PSC, the Public Service, Services Committee, led by President uh, Kevin Callan, where they had their negotiations on in the WRC with the, with the government and the Department of Public Expenditure. And they walked out of that deal, they walked out 
up the negotiation with a 5% offer. And they said, no way, we need significant improvements. And then we had all the, the back and forth over the summer where nothing happened. Then we hear talks are going to happen again. And there is a come back and say, oh, look, we've got 6.5%. Uh, that's great. That's the best we could do. And we're going to bring this back to members. Like, since when is jumping from 5.5% to 6.5% significant? Especially when you consider the rates of inflation that we've, we're, we've, we've just mentioned. We're talking current rate inflation is 12.2. Like six and a half is literally halfway to that. And that's not including what's going to be next year. Um, so, and if you're taking the account, what would be over the three years, from 2020 to 2023, you're talking at least 17.7%. Six and a half percent is totally, totally unacceptable. Um, and we've had these negotiations to come out, well, look, that's the best we're going to go. And they roll out the old mantra of Tina. There is no alternative. And we all know there's always an alternative. And one of the alternatives open to our trade unions is industrial action. And we've seen the success of industrial action in the UK. Industrial action is something that can be very, very effective. And collective trade union activity can, make, can enforce a fair pay deal. And that's all people want. That's all public sector workers want is a fair deal. And collective action, if we go out there, collective action It'll be the first time in a long time that people were out. Collective action shows that we can actually get a deal by taking industrial action. And I think the government is terrified of that. Um, so if we, can, if we accept this deal, right, if we accept the deal in its current, uh, its current offer, we're assuming we're getting a 6.5% pay rise and, we're going to, and inflation is going to be running at 17.7%. Uh, like what we're effectively what we're getting here is a pay cut of 11.2%. We're going to buy 11.2% less stuff with our money, on average. And like the quote, I suppose, Martin Luther King, the fierce urgency of now really, really applies to this. There is, a, is an urgent issue that needs to be addressed. Now, governments have put forward arguments over the years, multiple arguments over the years, why we shouldn't or why we can't afford this fair pay deal. But when we take it in context, tax revenue is up 26% in the last year. Now, when we look at that, What's it boil down to 10.4 billion? But that's the highest ever we've had to date. Exchequer surplus, 6.3 billion. And that's just in the first eight months of the year. Our GDP is up 10.6%. And people say, oh, GDP is overstated by the multinationals. This is the adjusted figure, the figure that strips out multinational activity. So on every metric, the government's flush with cash. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time we get our, our fair pay deal out of them. And in the past, what arguments have they used? Oh, we're in the middle of a Troika bailout. We need to balance the books, limited physical space. Oh, the, the future is uncertain. And this, there's always a reason to stifle public sector pay. But one thing about public sector expenditure, what I'd like to say is a public sector pay rise is largely um, cost neutral. So government said for every 1% pay increase, it costs about 250 billion. I love that. We get half back in tax, your income tax straight away, 23% back in VAT, and then you think about the knock-on stimulus for the economy of new jobs. It ends up being largely cost neutral. Um, so back to this, our government, uh, the measures that the government are going to take in the, in the upcoming budget are temporary. We're going to be temporary tax cuts. We're going to have temporary cost of living measures. Um, and at the same time, the inflation, the erosion of our pay is going to be permanent. So I think given that these temporary tax cuts and temporary cost of living supports, uh, we need to be very cognizant of the impermanent effect, the permanent deleterious effect that this inflation is going to have on our pay. Um, and I'd like to leave it there. Thanks very much. I'll pass you over to Katrina. Hi, everyone. And first of all, thank you so much uh, to uh, Deirdre and Keith for speaking before me. Um, I think it's so important. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Katrina Nikahan. Um, I am a Spanish teacher in a school in Limerick and I'm an activist uh, with the TUI. And um, yeah, just to say that, um, you know, just from what, what Deirdre was pointing out there around this kind of overly positive slant that, uh, that our unions are actually putting on this pay deal, but also the kind of narrative out there that Keith was kind of alluding to as well, uh, you know, that the government is, is you know, is, is kind of peddling around, around the idea that they can't afford anything more. 
Um, so I might kind of talk, go into some of those a little bit more as well. Um, but what I'd like to look at is kind of, uh, you know, something a, a little bit more general as well. Um, but yeah, just speaking personally as a post-primary teacher um, on the new entrant pay scale, and, and definitely it feels like since the start of the year, it's like two years of the pandemic never happened. Um, it's definitely the sense of back to business as usual, no exceptions, no excuses. And it, it really does feel like the pressure has never been stronger actually to bring our students to, you know, very unrealistic academic levels when you think about all the time that was lost during um, mitigation measures and lockdowns, etc. And there's no argument that teaching has become more uh, intense and demanding and the constant assessment and curriculum changes, the pressure to even deal with society's problems in our schools as well. And, you know, I'm thinking especially about the huge pressure that we came under, uh, you know, trying to manage a pandemic on a shoestring budget under conditions that were already affected by years of austerity. Um, and, you know, Teachers weren't thanked for risking their lives and health during the pandemic and quite the opposite in many cases. And now it's as though it never happened at all, you know. And it's no surprise then that in an ASTI Red Sea survey back in March that only 28% of secondary teachers weighted, rated their well-being as good or very good. And teachers saying workload and work intensity are the main factors impacting well-being and job satisfaction dropping from 63% in 2021 to 50% in 2022. And, you know, what we're looking at now is, you know, we're seeing in September how schools can't find teachers. Um, and with more than half of all post-primary schools with unfilled vacancies, might I add vacancies that in many cases wouldn't be enough hours to justify applying for the job in the first place. Um, so I think it is important to actually, you know, take stock for a moment, uh, you know, what we, are, what we are talking about. There's a history to that. And even when we think about building moment, the, the original building momentum agreement um, that, you know, that was supposed to be the first actual uh, pay increase for public servants in more than 10 years, it was a pay increase that did not address pay equality. And that was something that you, the unions were supposedly campaigning for, calling for, for, for years, you know. And interestingly, just very, you know, just thinking about what, what Keith said earlier on, the very first few paragraphs of the original building momentum document talks about financial uncertainty, talks about Brexit, talks about COVID, you know, and at the moment uh, with, with the present, um, you know, uh, public sector pay deal, you know, we, we, we heard Michal Martin come out and, and, and talk about the war in the Ukraine, you know, so there's always some reason, there's always some crisis and, and, and there's no doubt about it that this, this economic crisis is real, there's no doubt inflation is a real crisis uh, that, that we, we are presently experiencing and we're about to experience a lot more. Um, uh, but it, it's definitely worth looking at it in terms of, well, there's always going to be a crisis. And what seems to be happening all the time is that there's this immense transfer of wealth upwards, you know. Um, I, uh, also, the impact is felt most on those of us who either work in public services or rely heavily on these public services. And I'm thinking especially of young families, working parents, especially women uh, who are parents or who are single parents. And pay deal or no pay deal, you know, we're totally squeezed. And as someone who spends almost half of her wages on rent each month, and I'm not alone, um, you know, and what's more, because of the increasing hours and productivity demands of our jobs, we're just, just wrecked, you know. So I think this is why we should look at the kind of wider context in which this pay deal is offered. And it is being offered in a backdrop of rising prices for some of the most basic necessities. Um, and what Kate was saying earlier on, as we watch some of the biggest energy companies post their record breaking profits. And you know, it's no surprise that most people struggling, worrying about the future, feel genuine disgust, you know, around this. Um, just thinking about as well, uh, you know, the budget promises that have been made so far, you know, we know that this 6.5% is never gonna match inflation, but there seems to be this, uh, you know, stories coming out about how, um, you know, there'll be other measures there to alleviate some of the high costs, you know, for, for, for workers and their families. And, and bearing in mind that most of us are gonna be voting before we even, you know, hear about, uh, hear about the budget or see the budget. But even those, those, um, those uh, cost of living supports are so weak. You know, when you think about the energy credits that, that are being offered, they're gonna be wiped out um, by the price increases that are due in winter, no doubt about it. 
And another really important aspect in the budget, is, you know, for working families is childcare. And looking at Ireland compared to other countries, well, UNICEF states that rich countries should invest 1% at least of their GDP in early years. Ireland at the moment spends just 0.1%. And it's actually one of the few, or if not one of the only rich countries where childcare is private and for a profit. And what we have now is a situation where families, parents are, you know, spending at least a, a grand a month on, on childcare. And it, it's so obvious that, you know, these extra subsidies that are going to come through, well, if the system of this kind of private subsidized uh, uh, model is, is going to continue, it, it's never going to work. Okay, it's just going to drive up these, uh, these, these costs, uh, you know, not to mention causing many of us to actually put off, uh, you know, delay starting a family in the first place. Um, if you'd like to move on to the next slide, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so the president of ICTU said that he believed that the public sector pay deal was the best that could be currently achieved through negotiations. And yeah, that is absolutely correct, because negotiation is not proven to be fair or effective for teachers. Negotiation has not achieved pay equality so far. And even when we think back to the original building momentum deal, the current, the, the sectoral bargaining fund, which helped restore the HDIP and the PME allowance was money that could have been used to pay for something else that teachers also had a right to. So, you know, in other words, it is a completely manufactured and unfair uh, situation. And while our public sector unions are, you know, here negotiating, right now we're watching workers in the UK, in the North, in the North of Ireland as well, be they public sector or private sector, they're stepping into action. And the level of public support for mass campaigns, for strikes, campaigns like Enough is Enough, um, it's really unprecedented, but it's entirely justifiable as well. And even here in the South, there's been a high amount of industrial action and organizing. I'm even thinking yesterday, uh, over 1,000 workers in the charity sector went on strike because they haven't had a pay rise in 14 years. This October, college students are expected to have a mass walkout over the student accommodation crisis. And we as trade union activists should be showing our solidarity with initiatives like that. You know, people, groups of people who refuse to accept uh, the present situation, quite rightly. So, you know, one thing that we should remember from the pandemic is that our work as teachers is extremely valuable, you know, both financially and socially. And just like other essential sectors, such as nursing, you know, we've seen our wages and conditions being visibly driven down. And right now there is a chronic shortage of teachers. And, and this is also something that we hold in our favor if we were to wage any sort of campaign or, or fight. And there's plenty that the government could do tomorrow to alleviate our situation. You know, we should be asking why we're not getting a pay rise linked to inflation as it rises, um, which has been the case for public servants in Belgium for decades. Um, and, you know, Mick Lynch and the RMT unions have really set a standard around that. Uh, you know, the fact that wages should be linked with, it, with inflation at least. And just to give an idea of what could be possible, again, I know Keith mentioned a few uh, really good facts and figures as well. A 20% pay increase across the public sector would cost the state 3.4 billion euro. If corporation tax were at 20%, that would raise 10 billion. And that's one example of how the wealth mm -hmm. is actually there. So an inflation busting wage for public sector workers is entirely affordable if the will was there to do it. Mm -hmm. And you know we should be willing uh, to use the information that we're getting here today uh, to break that austerity narrative uh, once and for all in our workplaces, uh, in our communities. And, you know, just to conclude, um, my workplace, most of, most of the TUI members have already voted and it's definitely been kind of divided down the middle actually. And I do feel like a yes vote might be possible um, and maybe it would be a setback but I feel like as well that it's a very strong indication of the need to change the unions from below. And it's definitely been an opportunity to have these discussions in our workplace, to actually encourage colleagues to attend branch meetings, raise their concerns, you know, to network, link up and, you know, apply pressure on our executives to actually fight our corner and give them the confidence to fight our corner as well. Um, and so the cost of living crisis isn't going away anytime soon. And there's massive strength in our unions and in our power as teachers and I feel like that should be a really important takeaway uh, from this discussion 
Um, and yeah, if you're interested in getting more active in your workplace or in your union, um, if you're in TUI, please uh, contact the, uh, the email address there. We'd be delighted for, to hear from you. And um, obviously there'll be a cost of living protest in Dublin this Saturday with the presence of uh, TUI and the other unions as well. So I leave it at that and thanks very much. Super. Thanks so much, Katrina and Keith and Deirdre also. So we'll just conclude um, today's webinar, like very stark figures and great analysis there from our three speakers and uh, how crucial it is actually to be fully informed. So as Katrina has mentioned, whatever the outcome of the ballot, um, we'll urge um, you to share this webinar widely and also bring forth the traditions of the union like definitely staff meetings should be held this week um, and facts and figures shared amongst colleagues um, discuss I mean Glow have produced you've probably seen them online many leaflets and graphics so of TUI grassroots and ASTI fight back and but more importantly I think stemming from this irrespective of the result of the ballot it's to get active in your union, attend the quarterly meetings and bring the issues to our union executives. We sometimes forget that they're there to serve us and take our R from the staff room and into meetings. I mean, we had great, it was perhaps there, the great traditions in INTO especially, and I'm teaching now with older teachers who would often speak of the tradition of they all went to their meetings in the 80s. And we need to return to that. And actually, Ireland lost the largest amount of strike days per head of population in the 70s in, uh, uh, um, globally. So um, I'm just thinking also of the 1985 strike that INTO leaders, they can organize it when there is pressure from below. They organized 20,000 teachers, uh, special buses and trains were organized by INTO to um, march from Croke Park, 20,000 to Leinster House over pay erosion and um, deterioration of conditions in 1985. So now more than ever, given the facts that Keith has given us there especially, um, that has to be revised. And the best way to do that, I think, is that everyone has spoken to is each other. The cross-union solidarity is crucial. So, and Mick Lynch has also been mentioned, and he is actually giving um, great um, kudos to union members of their power. He's invigorated his union to no end. We saw members joining over the summertime in their thousands. And he didn't take the conciliatory compromising approach, but he stood firm for his members and defended industrial action as a core part, and this has been alluded to by all the um, speakers here, in ensuring dignity and respect for workers, but especially for future generations. And speak to any lower paid teacher and they will um, give you sight many examples to back that up. So revitalizing our union is not just paper membership that just adds to the union subs base that we currently have. It's actively organizing from grassroots level bringing the lived experiences of members to meetings, be that the workload, the uh, insufficient permanent contracts, or um, the pay deal at the moment being railroaded in before the budget and misinformation. So this is most important. So this, I suppose, webinar is for members to organize building cross-union solidarity, active uh, collective action. And we've seen it actually even to cite the states um, in um, we've had a red state revolt there, a brilliant book that I'd encourage by Eric Blanc to read, whereby even in the most right wing states of Arizona and Virginia in 2018-19, they grassroots level organized from below and actually gained up to 18 to 20 percent pay rises so it can be done. So remember, every vote counts. We are the union. So I'll just remind people um, of voting for INTO members. It's from today online ballot to the 28th ASTI members there um, I think school-based ballots and the deadline is the 5th of October and for TUI again school-based ballots and the deadline is 29th of September so I just like to thank um, all the speakers again today and especially behind the scenes with their amazing tech skills like to thank Jana and Paul and Pete and uh, just Nadine Nagy Jarmut again there's power in the union collective action and please take this webinar now share it um, at nauseum to all your WhatsApp groups, etc. And hopefully from the actually nearly 100,000 teachers in the country, hopefully with this information, we can begin 
begin growing grassroots, but a strong no, and we need this union, given the facts that Keith has given us regarding the cost of living crisis ahead of us, and begin building our unions to where they stemmed from historically and three decades ago. Baramila, thanks so much for listening, guys, and Sloan Live.